with Jesus Christ here this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you, Crow. Thank you, group. It's fantastic. It is a joy to be here with you this morning and to share in this word, in this chapel service with you. You know, I, uh, a few weeks ago, I got to speak to a, a high school football team, and I was there after practice, and I got all jacked up. You know, uh, the football days are way, way, way behind me, and I got two bad ankles, bad knees, bad shoulder to prove that I played, but boy, those juices started to flow. And uh, one of my students said, hey, you want to go out and take a rep? I said, no. I'm fine right over here on the sideline. But I'll tell you what, equal to that is to be around college students. Oh my God, to hear you guys coming in, to be a retired campus minister, and to hear those sounds of you guys coming in, and to see my lady Britt, Britt up there with her two beautiful daughters. Uh, Britt carried me at the University of Georgia. We had some phenomenal students there, and she carried me for over but she wasn't there the whole 20 years, uh, 27 years, but she carried me the time that she was there. And to be with Margaret and David, uh, I'm telling you, it's, it, it doesn't get any better than spending time with them. Known them for over 30 years now, back in our seminary days. And, uh, but it's great to be with you guys. And it's great to bring this particular message to you guys. That particular verse... I love what Barbara Brown Taylor and Brueggemann says about that verse. Now, we all know that it's talking about the what? The suffering servant, the prophecy of Christ's coming. But they also said he's talking about what? He's talking about the possibility of King, the king of Syria, that will also help and aid them in to get back. But some would take it even farther to say that he's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about Jacob, but he's talking about us. He's talking about us today. And I'm here to say something pretty bold to you. I want to say to you right now that you have been born for greatness. You have been born for greatness. Greatness. I wish you would go back and watch this old movie called Chariots of Fire. Eric Little says, Eric Little says that God has made me fast. And when I run, I feel his glory, and I feel his splendor, and I feel his presence. God has made you to be great. Not mediocre, not to be a has-been, not to be whatever. God has built you for greatness, for greatness. And, and it's all right here with five simple things that he's talking about. The first thing he says, we need to learn how to do what? How to listen. How to listen to the voice of God. Lean into the voice of God. He says what? Pay attention. Listen to me. Listen to me. It is extremely important that what I'm about to say to you, the prophet is saying, is urgent stuff. It's important stuff. And you need to really have ears to hear what I'm about to say to you. When our coach stepped in the huddle, well, a football, a basketball, or whatever, the first thing he says, eyes up and eyes on me, and we knew that what he was about to tell us is going to help us with whatever situation we're dealing with out there. That he has the game plan for whatever we're dealing with out there. And so our eyes were up, and we were in tune with what he had to say. It's just like stepping in a classroom, and the professor's lecturing, and then he paused for a moment and said, hey, you might want to write this down. Because this is important, and you may see it again. The prophet is simply saying, what I'm about to say to you is urgent stuff. It's important stuff. And you better really and truly get the ears to hear what I'm about to say to you. But it's not just urgent. It's not just important. It's inclusive. It's inclusive. We are so divided about everything we do these days. David likes the Wildcats. I like Carolina Tar Heels. And we go back and forth about who's the best blue blood. We are so divided about all kinds of things. The prophet says, not only is it important, but it's for everyone. He said, those who are near, which he meant the Jews, and those who are distant nations, he meant the Gentiles, which it covers all of us that's in this room here. Because if he wasn't Jewish at that time, all the other nations were Gentiles. He says, it is inclusive. What I'm about to say to you is for absolutely everyone. 
He had already said in, in chapter 40 in Isaiah, he says, I am what? I am Lord and maker of everything. Everything that has breath. Everything that has any life in them came from who? Came from God. So it's an inclusive message, but it's an intimate message. It's an intimate message. He said, draw closely to me and listen very, very carefully. My coach was a yeller and a screamer, but boy, when he looked at you and began to slow down and started to talk to you, he is speaking to you. He's not speaking to everybody else there. He's speaking to you. And he said to me once, he said, man, if you don't rebound, you come over here and sit with me. You can come over here and sit with me if you're not going to rebound. If you're not going to play defense, you come sit with me. An intimate voice, an intimate voice to hear. My mom just passed away about a month and a half ago. And every morning now, I'm listening for her voice. I'm listening for her voice. Because that voice would never go away from my mind. It would never go away from my mind. And you're here today, if your mom died uh, last week or 20 years ago, you still know that voice, an intimate voice. I'm an introvert, a strong introvert. And there's all kinds of stuff running through my head, constantly. I have to learn to listen to the voice of God, the intimate voice of God that slows down and begins to say to you, here's what I want you to be doing. Here's where I want you to go. Here's what's important at this particular time. We need to gain ears to listen and to hear the voice of God because he's speaking. But you can't hear him if you listen to all these other voices. These voices are telling you, you're too slow. You can't jump that high. You're not a great singer like someone else is. You got to discard those things and listen to the voice of God. And God says, I made you to do this. Eric Little says, he made me fast. He made me fast. And when I run, when I sing, when I play, I feel his glory. I feel his presence. Listen for that voice. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say this. I think we have to feel it. You need to feel these next verses, guys. You need to feel it. Now, I went to a very sophisticated black church. My pastor went, my now growing up, my pastor went to Mohouse College. He was friends with Martin Luther King, and he was a very dignified guy. They wore robes, and if anybody said amen in our church, you know, people looked around at him and all that kind of stuff. But I spent the summers down at my grandmama's house in the, in the country. And my grandmama's pastor was, was a stumper and a shouter, and he was a hooper. And he always said, and I still remember, I won't have a faith that I can't feel. He said, you need to be able to feel God sometimes, a faith. I want you to lean into these next few verses, guys. Lean into what he's simply saying and feel what he's saying. The prophet says that we need to feel the deep, the depth of the love and investment that God has made in each and every one of you. I want you to feel it. He says, before I was born, God called me. Think about that for just a second, guys. Before you was a twinkle in your daddy's eyes, God had already called you. He had already called you for a specific purpose, for a specific plan that he has for your life. And no one else can do what God has planned for you to do. No one else. He's already called you for that particular thing to do in this world. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say what? He has named you. All you Hebrew scholars in this room, Old Testament scholars in the room, you know that a person's name meant the essence of who they were. The very essence of who their character is. The very essence of who they are. Abram was born Abram. In the Hebrew, it meant exalted father. But when God called him to be Abraham, his name was changed into a father of multitude, a father of many nations. The name meant the very character of who you are, the character of what God was going to do in your life. I know names have changed now, and there are much modern day names, but God still knows your name. 
The scripture says he knows the hairs on your head. He knows absolutely everything there is to know about who you are. The very essence of who you are. The very essence of your character. And God says, I named you. But he didn't stop there. He says, I forged your mouth. Listen to the investment that God has made. He says, I have forged it. If you're looking for a voice, God has already given you a voice. He's already given you a voice. Jesus simply said what? When you're dragged before the majesties, when you're dragged before these folks, don't worry about what you're going to say because my Father in heaven will what? Will give you the words to speak. Guys, I want to tell you now, I grew up rough. I grew up rough. I really did. And I, and I played football, basketball, ran track, baseball. I did it all. And my whole life was wrapped up in how well I played. And my vocabulary, my vocabulary was horrible. Now, I didn't cuss around grown folks, but I cussed an awful lot at practice and all kinds of different things. When God saved me, my teammates began to say, man, what's wrong with you? Because they instantly saw that I weren't cursing anymore. I lost half of my vocabulary. He changed my voice. He changed my voice. He didn't change the passion for the game. He didn't change my intensity for the game. But he changed my voice. He changed that voice. He gave us a voice. Then he goes on to say what? He hid him in the palm of his hands. Now, guys, I don't want you to miss this now. He hid him in the palm, in the shadows of his hand. It says God holds them. I want you to think about that for a point one. The Hebrew people believed that God fought their battles. And why did they believe that? In Egypt, what God did, those whole ten plagues was God. God, Yahweh, was defeating all the minor gods of the Egyptian people. Defeating all those particular gods. God fought for them. And on the eve when the angel of death came through and they put the, 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 the blood of the lamb there, God did what? God went through there and God protected them. He protected them. When they left, finally, and Moses raised his arm, they walked across on, on dry soil, and when the Egyptian was trying to catch them, Moses' arms came down, and what happened? The sea collapsed on the Egyptian army. Boaz said to, to Ruth, who was supposed to be unclean for 10,000 generations, for 10 generations, he says, you have come and you're under the wings of what? The wings of protection of God. The wings of protection of God. God will protect you. Now, please, I'm not here speaking any prosperity gospel, please. Because I know, I know good things happen, bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. So please don't hear me saying that, hey, look. Bad things not going to happen to you in your life, because it will. But you know who controls those things and who's there for you. Who's there for you. He goes on to say what? He says, a, he says a polished hour. God has made you to be an efficient, an effective, successful person in what you're accomplishing. In the hands of God, on his bow, you are a proficient arrow, arrow and God, when God shoots it, it's going to hit its target. You are built and made to be successful. You are built and made for success. I want to say that again, guys, because I think you don't hear it. You are built and made for success. Why do you think Jordan never thought about the shots he missed? Jordan played for a guy by the name of Dean Smith, and Dean Smith said to him, you can only win. Players win games. The only people that lose games are coaches. He heard that for three solid years. You can only win. And if we execute the play to, 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 to its existence, then all you have to do is put forth your best effort. If it doesn't go in, you don't have to worry about it. Because the coach took the loss. 
It's what God is simply saying. All you need to do is to be the best person that you possibly can be. The best person that you possibly can be. And God takes care of absolutely everything else. Inefficient, ineffective. Arrow. And then he says, you what? He hides them in the quiddler. Guys, I want you to feel this now. I want you to feel what he is simply saying. Feel it. Man, how many five-star quarterbacks came through the University of Georgia by Stetson Bennett sitting there in the quiver? How many? At least four or five-star well, five quarterback came through, and Stetson Bennett, the mailman, they called him, was sitting there on that bench. Left for a whole year, came back, and still was not given a starting position. But now he's on what? The Mount Rushmore of University of Georgia football with two back-to-back -back national championships. Hit him in the quiver. You are God's secret weapon. You are God's secret weapon that God has there waiting. Waiting for you to step into. Step into his greatness for you and for your life. He goes on to simply say, you are my servant, Israel, in which I will display my what? Display my splendor. It will be the splendor of God. The splendor of God. I'm not saying this because he's my brother from another mother, but you guys have one here. The splendor of God, right here. There. If you check at other campuses, there's not a campus minister at, at the other religious schools right now. But he's here. And why is he here? Because your president saw that he meant something. He's God's servant here on this campus. He's God's servant. The splendor of God screams in here. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you test him. He knows everyone from the president to any lowly position that might be here. I don't know what those positions might be, because every position is important. He would know their name. He would know their, if they're married, he would know their, their lives. He will know what's going on in their lives. The splendor of God. Because he sees you as one who is called by God. He sees you as one who has been named by God. He sees you as one who has had the voice of God. He is here to nurture and to love you and to care for you and to help you to step into your greatness. That's what a splendor of God is. That's what a splendor of God is. And that's when people see it. You don't have to walk around screaming about it and pounding your chest. People see it and they know it. But what is the third thing he talks about here? You need to smell this. You need to smell this, guys. You need to smell it. Hey, I've smelled it. I've smelled it. When I left college, I thought I was going to go and, 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 and change the world and do all kinds of different things. And I labored at a couple of positions that I didn't like. And I smell. I smell the disgust of not being where God wanted me to be. I smelled it. Just like you feel the greatness, I want you to smell it. I want you to come familiar with it. I do not like losing. I do not like losing. I do not like feeling that smint in my, in my nostrils, that I'm not living everything that God called me to live. And I labored at a couple of jobs because I needed to take care of my beautiful wife, and I married way above myself. Way, way, way above myself. But they're nostrils until I surrendered. The third thing, to, to, to realize your, your real greatness, you have to surrender it all. And what did the prophet say? He says, man, I've labored in vain. I've labored in vain. Listen to it. Don't take my word for it. Read it in the scriptures. He says, I've labored in vain. And I've used all of my strength for what? For nothing. And for vanity. For vanity. Doing life your own way, guys, all you're going to sniff is what? That aroma of disappointment. And that aroma of disappointment does not smell good. I don't care if you got a beautiful wife, and I had a beautiful wife. 
I lived in a nice place. We drove nice cars and we had nice things. But boy, I did not like what I was doing because it was not what I was called to be doing. And I had to confess that I was sinning against God. And that's what this guy said. He said, but then he does what? He submit. I can still remember when I submitted, Margaret. When I finally said, my wife had married probably a basketball coach or something else, but she didn't marry a minister. And so I labored with that call for five years and I said, oh my God, she didn't, she didn't, she didn't come to me, it would be a minister. And I remember going to her and said, hey Georgia, <laughs> I think God's calling me into ministry. And she said this to me, God told me three years ago, just waiting on you. <laughs> just waiting on you. But I was such an introvert, I could not begin to see it. And what he says, I came to understand that my rewards, what is due to me is what? In God's hand, that's a mission. It's in God's hand. And he goes on to say what? A total surrendering is what? I am honored in the eyes of God. And that my strength has become what? God's strength. It's no longer my strength. I'm no longer trying to do life through my own power, through my own strength, but I'm surrendering and allowing God to do what? To take full control. To take full control. And God is screaming to do what? He is screaming to bless you. Jacob at Joppa River, you remember this conversation? Now God has done all these fantastic things in his life. And he's there, he's afraid of his brother Esau who's coming. He's back in the tent and for once he's standing on his knees and he's praying and he's screaming out to God and he's wrestling with God and God sit and he's winning. He's winning because God is not gonna go against your will. If you don't want to submit it and you don't want to surrender, he's not going to go against that. He's winning. And God reached over and he touched his thigh. And, the, and Jacob said these words. I want you to think about it for a moment. I will not let you go until you bless me. And I believe God is simply saying, boy, what are you talking about? Before you was in your mother's womb, I told her that I was going to love Jacob and not love Esau. Before you were in your mother's womb, I had already told her that you were going to be a great nation. I have blessed you at every, every step of your life. I, when you were out there alone by yourself, I opened up the heavens and let you see the angels coming up and going down. I have been trying to get your attention forever, son. You're going back here full. You got five wives. You got 12 kids. You got all the money in the world, and I've been trying to bless you, but you have had your attention and your time on being a grasper. A grasper. But I want to make you Israel. And that surrendering, guys, you got to surrender. You see, Samson was such a great individual with all the talent, all the power, with wit. People liked him. The strength of ten men. But he never did what his mom did. His mom looked up into the, in the ages and said, Lord, we don't know how to raise a special child, a Nazarite child. Please send someone down and tell us how to do it. Samson never went out into the darkness. He never looked up and said, God, you've given me all these gifts, all this talent. Show me now how to use it. I give it to you, give it back to me, and show me how to use it. God is waiting for you to simply look up and see him, and he says, okay, I'm going to tell you why you're here. I'm going to tell you why you're at Shorter. I'm going to tell you why you're doing what you're doing. He is just waiting for you to what? To wake up. To wake up and see him. Surrender to him and allow him to work. And then 1 Corinthians says, the not, to God's nostrils, the sweet smell of what? The fragrance of Jesus, of his death on the cross. He'll turn that stench into something glorious. 
And then the fourth thing, and I probably need to hurry. The fourth thing is just seeing the vision clearly. You need to be able to see. You need to be able to see through your eyes the universal scope of what God's trying to accomplish in our world. We can't see beyond what? Behind you on our hands. I can't tell you, David and I were like brothers at seminary. And another kid by the name of Frankie Joe, we were real tight. But there were a lot of guys, a lot of guys, that didn't understand why I would be friends with David and Frank. They were black guys, because there weren't many of us there. And they kept saying, man, come on, play ball with us, play basketball with us, hang out with us, do this, do that. And they were great guys. Some of them still my friends. But God didn't call me for a narrow scope. God didn't call me for a narrow scope. God called me for something that's bigger. Something that's bigger. You've got to see what he's saying here. He said, I born you to do what? To bring Jacob back. To me. Not back to you. Don't call Jacob to you. Call Jacob to me. Those who have wandered around, call them back to me. The universal scope of God's saving power and saving act, we'll never get there if we continue to, con continue to think that God is only loves me and mine. And people that looks like me, people who thinks like me, people who act like me, we'll never get there. We will never get there. I'm not saying you won't get to heaven, because you will, if you put your trust in Christ. But you won't live the fullness of what God has for you unless you get your eyes off of that narrow scope. He says the Jews will be saved. I don't care what you think, what you feel. Romans says that they will be grafted in. If you have a problem with me, read your scriptures. It says he will, they will be grafted back in. He says what? Those who have been scattered will what? Will come back. Yes, he's talking about the present, but he's talking about even now. That they're his chosen people. David and I was debating about who, who, who has been most persecuted in our world. Was it African Americans or Native Americans? And I said, well, certainly Native Americans, because there's not a whole lot of them left. But the Jewish people have been persecuted a great deal and still being persecuted. Still being persecuted. But God says what? He says, but also what? The other nations. And this would have been a foreign statement to, to, to Jewish people. That you're going to be the instrument of all these other nations going to do what? Come to know who Christ is. But God had already said it to Abraham. He had already said it to Abraham in Abraham 12 that you'll be the father of many nations. But God kept on saying it because they just didn't get it. And he'll keep on saying it to us that everyone has to be saved because the goal is what? That salvation will be what? Will reach the ends of the earth. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, hey, look, my father's still at work. My father's still at work. And I'm working. I'm working. And I can't do anything that what? That I don't see the Father do. Well, I can't do anything on my own. He is waiting for us to get a glimpse of the mission and to see what he got, got in store for you. And I'm telling you, there's a beautiful world out there, guys, if you just submit. I'm a little poor kid from Gaston, South Carolina. Gaston, South Carolina. I don't think anybody in this room know where Gaston, South Carolina is. They didn't think enough of Gaston, South Carolina to put a stop sign there. There's a flashing yellow light. I went back to see my relatives this past, past month, and it's still a flashing yellow light. No black kid, no black kid in the 60s should have done the things that I've got a chance to do and see at all. I'm not talking to you about something I'm, I suspect. I'm talking about something I've lived, guys. There's nothing in my dreams that would make me think that I'll be standing here speaking to you because I wouldn't say two words to anybody publicly. God will do 
some great and mighty things in your life if you would just totally surrender and allow him to work. Because he is dying to work in your life. He is dying to work in your life. Last thing, I'm going to get out of here. The unwavering what? The unwavering trust in God's provision and God's care. He said, this is what the Lord said. The Holy One. About those who what? Has been despised. A whore to the nations. Slaves to all nations. I want you to think about that for a moment, guys. We love the Stetson and Bennett story, but the scripture is the Stetson and Bennett story. It really is. But people coming out of nowhere. If God wanted to get the best of the peoples that were there at that particular time, he would have chose the Philistines. He would have chose the Egyptians. He would have chose the, Syri the Syrians. Because they were already great. They were already great nations. But he chose a, 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 a lowly bunch of slaves that was despised, that was not trusted. And God turned them into what? A great, great nation. A great people group. A people that surrendering and trusting in their God. In their God. An unwavering trust. That he says that what's going to happen is kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down and worship you. Because of who? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. And God will work. And God will move. And God will use you. If you would just simply allow him. To use you. Now, everybody knows Eric Little's story. They knows that he refused to run in a trial race in the Olympics. In the 100 yard dash. He refused to run. Because it was on Sunday. And then he ran in the 400. And won a gold medal in the 400. But that's not the end of the story. He goes on to be a great missionary. Great missionary. Wonderful missionary. Touching lives for Christ there. And then when war broke out, he was a prisoner of war. And when everybody was clinging and grabbing and trying to get their portion in those camps, he was gathering the little kids, teaching Bible studies, teaching them to learn how to memorize scripture. Whenever he got a windfall, he would feed those little kids. He was there loving and caring on them in a very, very difficult time. And before the war was over, they tried to plead with him to leave and to go back to his wife, who was already pregnant with their last child. He never get to see his last child because he stayed there in that imprisonment. And he gave his life there because he knew that that's what's where God wanted him to be an unwavering trust an unwavering trust in God's hands guys you got to trust him just trust him and allow him to show you some great and mighty things in your life let's pray Father, how grateful we are for your love, your grace, and your great mercy. We're grateful, dear God, that you